Hello and welcome. Thank you so much for coming out tonight on this beautiful evening. It's really an honor to appear alongside these two brilliant women and to stand at this podium where I've seen so many other talented writers appear. I could go on at length about uh, my experience with this program, my gratitude for um, my ins inspirational cohort and our, wonderf our wonderful mentors and our guardian angel, Sherry Fernandez-Williams, uh, as well as the privilege of living in a city that has a legacy of really cherishing and supporting the arts. Um, but I'm gonna cut to the chase. I have a portion of a story to share with you tonight that I've been working on. Uh, the working title of my story is Welcome to the Glamour Zone. It's told from the perspective of a 10-year-old girl named Tara. Um, I've been very interested in child narrators and protagonists lately because of the frankness of their observations and also the way that children are so often caught up and at the mercy of adult dynamics and phobias and the drama that results from that. So, welcome to the Glamour Zone. When Brian Murphy called Patsy Baines, Fatsy Baines, hollered it across the cafeteria, she picked up a fish stick from her lunch tray and lobbed it straight at his face. Patsy and I were standing in line with the rest of our fifth grade class, inching along the metal counter while lunch ladies slopped baked beans and canned peaches onto our trays. Brian ducked, but Patsy's aim was good. The fish stick made limp contact with his jaw before flopping onto the tabletop. Patsy and I found an empty table and sat down to our fish sticks. Patsy speared a single baked bean with her spork and bit down on it with her flat, square front teeth. I scanned her face to figure out whether the insult had upset her, but the pale yellow boomerangs of her eyebrows and the glitter twinkling across, across her cheeks gave her a look that said to the whole world, don't mess with me. The Baines lived out at the end of my block where the houses backed up to a small man-made lake. Willow Lake was its name, but everyone just called it man-made. I figured Patsy and I were friends for two reasons. One, because we were both fat, and two, because we lived on the same block. Beyond that, we had nothing in common. Patsy wore t-shirts spangled with rhinestones and bell-bottoms fastened with a thick belt. At recess, her voice ricocheted off the playground equipment and echoed through the potholed street behind the school. Patsy was better at being a fat kid than I was. She threw her weight around. I dragged mine. Her posture held no apology. You ever wore lipstick? Patsy asked me one afternoon as we crossed the street on the way home from school. I shook my head. Eyeshadow? Unless you counted the white stuff I smeared on my face the time I dressed up as a clown for Halloween, I had never tried using makeup. I hardly even dressed like a girl, let alone wore eyeshadow. At the end of every summer, when my mom took me back to school shopping in the girls' plus-size section at Sears, I always rerouted to the boys' department, the Husky Rack, where I loaded up on the same overalls and cargo jeans I picked up every year. Well, said Patsy, spitting a gob of gum back into its foil wrapper, my mom says you can come over and she'll show you how. We'll do makeovers, hairdos, and everything. Mrs. Bain sold makeup for a living. She'd slipped zebra print postcards into our mailbox, inviting my mom to her sales parties. But my mom recycled the postcards and kept using her same old mascara from Walmart. I brought up the makeovers, all casual, while my mom was unpacking groceries. She paused with a cantaloupe tucked into the bend of her elbow. What does a 10-year-old kid need a makeover for? I, struggled and, I shrugged and nibbled the tip of my thumbnail. Mom lowered the cantaloupe into the fruit bowl on the counter, laid it down like a baby in a crib. Do you want to go, she asked. I was embarrassed to admit it, but I did want to go. Maybe a makeover was all I needed to become more like Patsy, a stylish fat girl with pizzazz to smooth out my bulk. I whispered yes and fiddled with a loose thread on my sleeve. I felt my neck getting hot under the scratchy blob of my ponytail. Mom walked over and put her hands on my shoulders. She looked at me with her eyes that were the same as mine, dark brown and eager like a shepherd dog's. Okay, she sighed, but this is not going to turn into a sleepover and you are not going to let Mrs. Baines sell you any of that lipstick she's always peddling. 
Her voice was bossy, but I saw the start of a smile catch at the corners of her lips. She wrapped her arms around my shoulders and gathered me against her cushiony body. The Saturday of the makeover party, I put on Mary Jane shoes and a black velour jumper, the only dress I owned. It was raining, so my mom drove me down the street to the Baines house, where Patsy and Mrs. Baines answered the door together. Patsy had on a denim skirt with pink tights, and she'd applied such a thick layer of glitter gel it was starting to peel and flake off her cheeks. My mom was fat, same as me, but Mrs. Baines was about a size two. She wore blue jeans with sequin butt pockets, and her hair poofed around her face like the big squirts of frosting on the edge of a cake. Look at little Miss Tomboy dressed up so cute. Mrs. Baines set her fists on her hips and leaned toward me. I didn't know if I was supposed to say, say thank you or what, so all I said was, yep. <laughs> My mom pulled her hood over her head and passed her car keys from hand to hand. Thanks for hosting, she said in that TV lady voice she only used around other mothers. Tara is very excited. She ruffled my hair before heading back to the car, calling through the streaks of rain that she'd be back at 9.30 to pick me up. I watched her back out of the driveway and onto the smooth pavement of Aspen Lane. The tomatoey smell of the Baines house settled over me, and I started to get the feeling that I was very far from home instead of just at the end of the block. Inside the Baines house, if you were quiet, you could hear all the nature sounds rippling up from man-made lake. Chirps and croaks, rustling leaves, the occasional plop of a sunfish leaping from the water. When I was a little kid, man-made didn't even exist. Just a big, ugly gravel pit sat in its place, like a slice of outer space on the edge of town. It took three summers to shovel it out and haul in new dirt, reroute stormwater, plant trees, and stock the lake with fish. Patsy wasn't allowed to go to the lake alone. Mrs. Baines wished they'd put something nice there instead, like a golf course or some shops. The neighborhood's gone downhill since they put in that lake, I heard her say. Don't want to say out loud what kind of litter I seen left in the cattails. Mrs. Baines stuck a bag of popcorn in the microwave, and Patsy and I were sent to the garage to get a bottle of grape soda. The Baines kept an extra fridge out there with a stash of Coors Light, bottled water, and all different flavors of pop. After pushing past the lawnmower and a couple old bikes, Patsy pulled open the yellowing fridge and thrust a cold bottle of grape Shasta into my arms. We picked our way back through the garage to the house. After we'd poured ourselves cups of the bruise-colored drink, Mrs. Baines led us down to the basement, where she'd made a fancy entryway by taping pink streamers to the top of the door frame. The streamers parted and fluttered when we pushed through them. Welcome to the glamour zone, Mrs. Baines trilled, <laughs> holding her arm out like Vanna White. <laughs> She'd set up a card table with a lacy tablecloth and a glass dish full of peppermints. Three folding chairs circled the table, each with its legs wrapped in streamers. First thing, Mrs. Baines said, go wash your faces. I followed Patsy to the bathroom. She wet the corner of a hand cloth and rubbed it against her cheeks to scrape away the crusted on glitter. I peered at my reflection and tugged at the stretchy fabric of my dress where it strained against the swell of my stomach. Patsy found my eyes in the mirror as I bent over the sink to splash my face. She'd rubbed her skin all red and shiny, but a couple patches of glitter held on close to her eyes. You excited? I think so, I said, drying my face with the sleeve of my dress. When we got back to the glamour zone, Mrs. Baines had laid out what looked like a shiny vinyl suitcase. She worked the zipper around the edge of the case until it fell open to reveal rows of tubes and wands, pots of creams and powders, brushes in all sizes strapped to the lining with thin elastic bands. Patsy unwrapped a peppermint and stuck it in her mouth. Tara should go first, she said, the peppermint clacking against her molars, because she's the guest. Mrs. Baines sat me down in one of the folding chairs and picked out a saucer-sized brush from the case. She blew on the brush and rubbed it around in a dish of powder. A, clou a cloud rose from my cheeks when she came at my face with it. I coughed. Close your eyes, she said, pressing a dry finger over one of my eyelids and then the other. She dusted the brush over my forehead, chin, and cheeks. When I thought she was done, I opened one eye. Mrs. Baines hovered over me, working the cap off a metal tube and squeezing pink goo onto the back of her hand, smearing it around like paint on a palette. 
She added dollops of peach and blue from other tubes and told me to keep my eyes closed. I squeezed them shut until fireworks crackled behind my eyelids. Tilt your head back, said Mrs. Baines. I pointed my chin toward the ceiling. Not that far. She placed a hand on either side of my <laughs> she, she placed a hand on either side of my head to position it the way she wanted. She moved her fingertip across my eyelid in quick dabs. My eyeball bounced in its socket. So, who are the cutest boys in school these days? she asked. As usual, Patsy volunteered five or six names while I stayed silent. By then, I'd learned not to admit to these things. I'd let it slip to Patsy that I had a crush on Philip Moreno, the most popular boy in our class. Patsy told Angie Lee, who told Philip, and by the end of the day, Angie had scooted up to me by the coat cubbies and announced, I talked to Philip, and he says he doesn't like you that way. I did not need a report from Angie Lee to know Philip would never like me. For a fat kid, crushes were fantasies, not goals. And if I were tough like Patsy, I might have kicked Angie Lee in the shins for sucking at keeping secrets and for telling me something I didn't need to hear. Don't you like any boys, Tara? Pried Mrs. Baines. Not really, I said. Patsy probably thought I still liked Philip Moreno, but I didn't. And if my eyes wouldn't have been closed, I would have stared her down to make sure she didn't blab. Mrs. Baines twisted my hair up and stuck it with bobby pins until the skin of my forehead felt stiff and stretched. I had no idea what I looked like. There was no mirror around. We had to wait, Mrs. Baines explained, for the big reveal. That's all for today. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>